Hi, Elise. Is that Mike? It is. Hi, Mike. How's it going? It's going really well. How are you? I'm glad to hear it. I'm pretty good. I took last week off, so I am refreshed, recharged. Oh, good. Re did, you go, did you go somewhere? Yeah, I, uh, I went to Germany, and I think I booked the tickets the day before Russia invaded Ukraine. So <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was being a little unsure there for a while. <laughs> How was it? It was great. My uh, one of my best friends from childhood is having her first kid, so it was mostly about uh, celebrating with her. Uh, she's in her second trimester, so that oh was exciting. Gosh. That's really <laughs> exciting. Yeah. Boy, so that's a quick quick trip to, for so far. Yeah. Luckily, the like coming back west, the jet lag is really advantageous. I woke up at 5 a.m. this morning, just bright eyed and bushy tailed <laughs> to work. Nice. <laughs> oh, good. Hey, Drew. Hey, Mike. Hey, Elise. Greetings. I'm going to make you the co host. I got to find which of the 5,000 things are open. Okay. One thing I did do while I was over there, Mike, um, Dave Intner turned me on to this actually. There's a a design museum just south of the city my friend lives in um so we got to see some fun architecture at the the vitra design museum oh wow what so what what town were you in oh uh, i was in freiburg in germany um, yeah. and i speak french i don't speak german so i hopped over the the border a little bit <laughs> when i was able that's nice yeah yeah she set up in a good spot you know well it's, it's too bad you couldn't spend more time it's always nice to have a yeah, you know, it's a little bit of a sojourn, but you take what you can get, right? Yep, exactly. I'm I'm hoping to get back there sometime soon. Maybe I can spend a little longer, or even even God forbid, work from there for a little bit. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's that that that's doable. I mean, I know two people, two friends of mine are working in Europe right now, and um, they tend to have to work a little later into the evening, but the first yeah. half of their day is usually pretty open. All right. Plus, when they're done working. They are this one one friend is in Spain, the other's in Italy. So it's not bad once they're done. Not so bad. Drew, do you want to uh, do a quick uh, test to make sure that you can share and everything's going the way it as it has expected? How's that? That looks good. Um, why don't you advance a slide? Beautiful. Okie dokie. So who else who else are we expecting, I guess? Uh, let's see. Uh, Brian Selby, Carrie, uh, Eric. Is Eric here? Eric's Eric here. here. Um, Jeremy. I don't see Jeremy yet. And Boxon. I see Bach. Hey Bach. Okay. So we got we got a while. Hey, Mike. Hi, y'all. Hey, Bob. Hey. Hey, Elise. And everyone. Here comes Carrie. That's Jeremy. Good. Hey, Carrie. So we'll give everybody a couple minutes to still a couple people to want to filter in. Jeremy, are you are you there? I didn't hear you say hi. I saw you un unmuted yourself, but I didn't hear he's, anything. He's muted right now.
Uh, so give Jeremy a second to call in so that we can have a two way chat. Dominique. Dom, okay. So Dominique is getting some food. She'll stay muted. We'll give Jeremy a minute to reconnect by phone. Okay, it looks like we have the go ahead from Jeremy. Um, so Jeremy, if you have any questions, you just go ahead and this chat seems to work fine for us. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand this off to uh, Drew to share our results with the California Energy Building Energy Modeling Software Industry Analysis. Drew? Great, thank you, Mike. Um, this uh, is just a really short summary of, of the report. I pulled some of the key images out. This is um, similar to one I did for CalBIM in the fall. We also did a similar national look uh, for uh, DOE and, and Lawrence Berkeley Lab uh, back last year as well. So this is a, a, a kind of a top-down look at the of, of the market. Uh, please feel free to stop me, ask questions. I know we've got some outstanding questions on this, but uh, we can go through those uh, if you like when we get there. So the, the study, we commissioned a, a contractor to take a look at uh, what was going on, uh, the market size, market segments, and what was driving the industry and in, in any barriers that was specifically for the, the uh, uh, work for, for DOE. But <clears throat> so things we looked at trying to use kind of published sources, uh, what, who were the developers, what was the market, um, what were the segments that were going on there, and then uh, try to estimate from that uh, economic, uh, ben, uh, <coughs> excuse me, economic impact. Uh, also try to look at categories of the consumers and how that information is being used out in the marketplace. So to look at the California market, we did a subset of the, the overall market for the US looking at LinkedIn profiles, which provide a lot of information. Now, there's a lot of overlap and we know there uh, can be some uh, issues. It's, it's not 100% accurate because um, you know people may not have energy modeling in their skill set, but looking at uh, these various uh, topics and then doing subsets of that. So we have engineering, consulting, 
architecture, design, build, and research is his topic areas. And then looking from that, how uh, the ones that specifically listed BIM-related skills, their share of open source only uh, users, so those people that were uh, specifically citing some of the open source software or the free software, uh, and what the total end users were for that with the count of purchase licenses. So, so from that, uh, looking at the uh, part that are commercial software versus the freeware or open source uh, and what their economic impact was, we came up with about 3,000 uh, core users of simulation software in California. 60% or so in engineering, another 20 are more in consulting, 10% in architecture, five in design build, and 4% uh, or so in, in the research sector. Uh, so there were some things we tweaked the numbers to try to see what was happening. The baseline model was about uh, $5 million uh, of, uh, of market for that, but looking at some things that could impact that or grow that, <coughs> excuse me, it's springtime here in DC. <coughs> um, by higher price point, could raise that to almost six, uh, improving modeling skills, raise it another million dollars to seven, and then combining those, we could probably get to $8 million. So uh, about a 60% increase in, in upside of that market just with existing users set. Uh, as far as the open source side of things, this compares how the US uh, um, versus uh, California. You see in most fields is pretty equivalent, but in architecture, uh, it's higher in the US and also in research there. Uh, otherwise in California, there's more uh, push toward um, a little bit more on the open source side. So that's pretty much the, the presentation. So I'm um, Carrie, Mike and I are open to questions. Hey, Drew, this is Alex. Um, how did you, what, what kind of assumptions did you use for estimating the, I forget what term you used, but in terms of estimating the dollar amount? Yeah, uh, this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to remember that. Mike, do you, it's been so long since I looked at it. Um, you remember right offhand? It was based on the um, how much the tools are costing, and I think they were looking at oh, right. whether it was individual costs or you know companies buying packages. So there were some estimates, but it's yeah essentially based on how much are people paying for the tools. This is not right. an estimate of like how much does it, how much is the energy savings save? That's it's not that. It's it's how much is the tool. Yeah. So that's the, uh, and we did survey in uh, the, the broader US market one, we did survey a number of uh, developers specifically to get their, the number of units they were selling plus uh, their cost. Got it. And then these, the numbers here, like the 2,880, 200, is, is that just to connect the dots here? Um, that's just based off the, the LinkedIn profiles or is that starting with the LinkedIn profiles and then some adjustments based off that to kind of- uh, That's estimate. primarily off the LinkedIn profiles and okay. the self-reporting of people and what they're using. Okay. There was a lot of parsing to get there because building modeling often meant building information modeling and you know, they're, there's some intersection there, but that wasn't the focus for this, uh, specifically on the energy modeling side. Right. Now, this is Eric, I guess to follow up on that, do we have any kind of data points or sanity checks to you know, compare, for example, this 3000 number with um, data from vendors on sales in the, California? That was partly where uh, some of the information and the percentages that we were getting um, 
was you know, self-reported information from the vendors um, and, and trying to align that specifically with the California market. Okay. I had one other question on those um, sort of increasing market size scenarios. I forget which slide it was, but- uh, This one? Yeah, this one. So how is it that the, what was the modeling skills hypothesis? Uh, that involved uh, implementing training regimes and improving the, the, the skill set of the market in general. So people would be more likely to buy software. Right. If they were trained, okay. And that was trying to take a look at where the, where's the, where's the most likely growth area. So looking in architectural firms, if people, if there were cases where people had um, use of basic tools, um, particularly in early, early, early design, that they would likely use them. Okay. I mean, I was also curious if based on any of the data collected would allow us to say anything about um, demand for services in the energy modeling market, like um, whether there's a, a changing, you know, changing demand or any trends or um, both for services and potentially for you know, jobs for energy modelers. Yeah, Eric, that's the main crux of what initially we were pushing, which is that that's the question everyone has. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the only way to get a trend is to find a baseline and then measure it year over year. Um, so that's what we've been sort of hoping we could push is in order to be able to forecast growth areas um, or we plateaued in some way that uh, a multi-year review of this space would be helpful. Yeah, so this really is just that first baseline model. Um, we tried to get some information when we did the, the US, but like Mike said, that just, there's no, no long-term or even short-term view of that. Was this same model applied on that national scale? The methodology, yes. The methodology, yes. I don't believe we looked at this market model change on the on the US. Okay, so you'd be able to compare the far left bar. Right. I right. See. And this particular chart is for California only? That's California only. Okay. And remember that's just for software itself. That's not for the services the software provides. I see. Can this be used to project the scale of demand for BEM workers in California? Possibly. If we were to possibly yeah. estimate like how many projects they're doing on average. Um, yeah, trying to, I guess I'm curious if there's a way to use this to get to um, whether or not there are enough BEM workers in the field currently, or mm -hmm. there's a gap to be filled, or there are too many. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, there's no solid conclusion simply because one, without more year over year data, it's hard to even come up with a beginning estimate. I see. And then also one of the challenges of doing this kind of, you know, it's a very small market, plus it's um, it, it's Venn diagram touches all kinds of different other markets and, and, and uses. So that has been a, the greatest challenge is to come up with any sort of clearly delineated user group, because um, as Eric will tell you, um, you know, you can hire a practitioner to do a building energy modeler, but it's not sure they're in Hawaii, excuse me, not in California. Uh, it's not sure, it's, you know, it's never really um, stayed like, so what tools are you, are you gonna use these tools exclusively? And then how much did you pay for them? I see. So it's, uh, you know, it's a, it, I, again, 
it's good to have some information so that we can build upon that. And the intention here was to also um, be able to ask ourselves questions. For example, the one you've you've just come up with, which is, is this market? Is there are we looking at a potential of not having enough skilled workers to meet demand in California? I see. And I your point is well taken that that question will be easier to answer with uh, a second, third, and fourth time yeah. series point. Yeah. Yeah. I, exactly. I think we we definitely should uh, you know look forward at trying to get a a survey of some of these uh, the people that are actually in the market and uh, to to see if we can get put some sort of valuation on on what it is they're doing with this $5 million worth of software. Because mm. I think that's really the, the key thing. What economic activity are we driving beyond just supporting software vendors who may or may not be in California? And, and from my vantage point, we don't have the data to figure this out, but I think one of the things I would love to get a better grasp on is, you know, what is the market of buildings that should have energy analysis that aren't having them done right now? And you know, how can we get at those folks to help with better designs? Yeah, so Eric here again, I was wondering about whether there's kind of been thoughts about methodologies for getting some of these data that we're talking about. Cause it seems like, you know, the, the LinkedIn methodology will only take you so far and um, you actually have to get into you know, talking to people and, and pulling out some kind of data that just really doesn't exist anywhere because, you know, we're not part of any existing architecture market surveys or engineering market surveys or anything like that. It's, so, um, Has there I'm been an attempt to talk to the, the vendors, the software vendors themselves? And I, you know, I'm, I'm we, sure we did talk to the software vendors initially, but uh, you typically the, vendors don't know how their software is getting used. Could you set this up with a like a HERS database or um, I guess for the California market for the non for anyone that does a performance approach is probably using some type of software. I don't know if that data can be synced up with any of this study. I think that'd be one good yeah. source for going forward with it, yes. Same point. So at least from the impact evaluations, we know you know how many hers things are pulled per year. Um, so we could be looking at it against the number of software users. Yeah, I think it ought to have a, a focus. I know that when I did surveys of O2 use this 20 plus years ago, um, initially we were getting a split. This was self-reported from users saying that they were using it about half for uh, new buildings and half for existing. And uh, by the end of, of 2005 or so, it was more like three quarters to seven eighths on the existing building side and, and not so much on the new building side. Now, that was kind of early days of LEED, but LEED energy modeling is not quite, not quite as robust as some of the other uses. On this graphic here, how did you split uh, between commercial software and freeware again? Is that just what was most prevalent on their LinkedIn profile? Or? That was partly looking for key terms off the LinkedIn profile. And that that's one of the ways that we parse some of the, looking at the categories there on the right, um, where they were reporting specific activities or specific software in their, their model. Mm -hmm. So if they reported eQuest or or others, they were getting kind of more of that freeware site. How do you handle like if there was multiple um, values? You know, so if they had listed commercial and freeware, or if they listed like engineering and consulting. Um, I, I don't remember, but mostly we were lucky to get anything out of LinkedIn on that. Yeah. So multiple I users, go, unusual. I have to go back and but Drew, I think what might be happening is if people listed both, they're, they're counted as two distinct users. Um, but it seemed like that wasn't a common scenario. Okay. 
it, it's pretty rare that you'll see multiple because it, most practices that I deal with, they get one or two packages at most and tend to stick with that because they've made a major investment in it mm -hmm. or a training investment in, in open source or freeware. So the, the LinkedIn data accessing, cleaning, the, the whole workflow there um, led to these graphics. Were you guys able to, uh, or not able to, but did you do any surveys or interviews um, outside of that? Not, we, we did with the vendors early. Okay. And that was actually how we were able to, uh, to collect some of the data that's in the, the US version of this report. Oh, cool. So that, that's kind of why we can extrapolate commercial software is approximately X dollars per end user. They wouldn't, the vendors wouldn't tell us exact numbers, but they would, when we showed them what we were finding, they would say, that's what we're that's getting close. something very similar. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, certain firms would be like, no, no, our number's way higher. We have more users than, than in, and some of that was, um, yeah, we were challenged by the fact we had to divide it. You, know, you have to figure out who you're speaking to. Is it a salesperson? Is it, you know, somebody that actually is going to give you, um, a, you know, uh, not an optimistic uh, number, um, but having talked to all the major vendors, um, we, we have a pretty good sense that, you know, their confidence level what we're finding is at least, you know, within a target range, their, their agreed upon target range. Okay. And this is a pretty good sized chunk I forget what the percentage is, Mike, but is it like somewhere 15 to 20% of the US market? If I remember the numbers right. Mm, yeah, I don't recall either, but I think that that sounds about right as far as the, the California mark percentage of a national. Yeah, I do remember that California was disproportionately representative, meaning we have more, more users on average. Well, 50 years of using simulation and the energy Title 24 makes, drives a lot of that, I think. Another data point in California would be um, sort of number of KBEC members and number of ABIPSA members in California. Or maybe, maybe if they'd be willing to share like the number of people in California on their mailing lists <laughs> as. Um, for yeah, people. one of the things noted in the report is that it's kind of difficult to really parse out what's truly California versus what's not because so many consultants work both within California and outside. And um, so it's not, there's not a strict border there. Sure. Is a uh... CBEC, would that fall into this freeware? Category or? Yeah, that, that's right. Okay. And um, does anyone know on this call that if does uh, CEC or Wilcox or Noresco, are they able to track users and accounts? I imagine, C, I imagine CEC does, but. Um, I haven't seen any indication of size of that. Yeah, but 200, just if it's including CBEC is way too low. Just as a CBEC user, I know that I don't have to give any identifying information when I download and install the software. But uh, okay. I don't know if it's, uh, if it's tracking me behind the scenes or not. <laughs> Yeah, and just to clarify my earlier, Drew, it's correct to say that if they listed CBEC, we would have counted them in freeware, but we don't think that everybody who does CBEC listed it, right? Yeah, I I would think so. I would, uh, yeah. you know, for LinkedIn, you're promoting things that you're very good at. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just clarifying that I meant if they said it, we we count that as, as yes. free, but yes. we, we, don't, we don't think we have the full number there. I think you're seeing a lot of things like eQuest and Open Studio there. 
that's sort of what was getting reported. So this is Buck. I'm I'm new to this TEC, but I'll I'll find out if there's a way of tracking over views. I don't of all the information I've been looking at, I don't think we track users per se. I think uh, we do track the um, documents that do come in when they come into our uh, registry or the report generator. But that's uh, it, it. That doesn't really count users per se. Oh, I'm asking my team right now, and I'll. Hope maybe they'll get back to us in a few minutes. But see, if we were to try and get a question on an existing, um, like engineering market size survey, just to speak in generalities, which one does anyone have an idea of which ones exist and and could be targeted? I didn't follow that question, Elise. You oh. said other existing surveys. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, to tie back to the discussion on how you know this data, um, really well defined for building energy modeling, doesn't really exist. Um, and I was sort of asking the question of for the industries for which it does exist, um, could we come up with? a list of those surveys that generate that data and maybe go about seeing, getting a building energy modeling question on those surveys. Okay. That's something definitely we can pursue. Yeah, I'm not personally familiar with who does that research. I, you know, I have seen surveys uh, that estimates the number of energy efficiency and renewable energy jobs in the US. I'm sure people have seen some of those and it might, I don't, I don't know offhand uh, specifically which, you know, who's doing those types of surveys. Yeah, a lot of it comes from um, Bureau of Labor statistics. Yeah. Because they, they have a good finger on the pulse as it were. The slide that's up right now is the one from the um, from the U.S. market one. So that's five million out of the thirty-four is California. Another, um, I don't know. This is random thing. Another potential data point would be the AIA's. You know, 2030 registration that I know we've seen some people evaluate that, but talk about talks about the number of projects that have used energy modeling. Yeah, I'd be curious to see whether they have any real information on what the impact was. Yeah, right. I was just thinking that, you know, they I remember Amir Roth reporting on sort of the number of just projects or the number of projects that were reporting and then the fraction of those that self-reported having used energy modeling. Yeah. Uh, this is Brian Selby. Sorry, a little late here. We overrun on another meeting. But um, the the software market, I heard um, Eric say something about, you know, looking at uh, memberships of various organizations, which may be problematic. I know at least in the compliance uh side of things um you know the the market actors generally use several different pieces of software so i don't think you know uh, estimating that based on um you know the the size of a particular organization or the number of members would be all that particularly helpful um it just might indicate the number of of users but they could be using you know various sorts of software so so I'd add that. Yeah, Brian, we kind of talked about that. Uh, yeah. Much of what you see here is pulled from um, LinkedIn profiles. Uh, so it's gotcha. self-reported by people, of, oh, great. Uh, which you know, one or more software packages they may have used. Sure. This is Dominic with SDG&E. 
Um, Drew, I know you're, I see your name on the, the email list. So I know you're on the, the building sim emails uh, distribution list. Was that a source of data for any of this? I, I don't know how you could use it, but I. Yeah, we did not go there, but I think if we really wanted to get a, a good cross section of users, that would be where I would start. There are a number of other, not just building sim, but other places and, you know, surveying our own membership. We've done sorts of that in the past, but not really getting down to the granularity of what software they're using. And then another, maybe just a anecdotal source of data. Um, and I don't, I was looking through my LinkedIn profile to see if he's still in business, but Bob Fassbender, uh, founder of energymodels.com. Yeah. Online training. I don't know if he would uh, be a useful source. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I think if we were trying to go after the users in detail, that would be one of the places we go next. It strikes me that, I mean, it's not necessarily part of this project, but if we're trying to establish data and trends that in this kind of study, if we tracked a number of things like, well, how many people are on the building sim email list and how many ABIPSA members are there and how many KBEC members are there, whatever data we could get, you know, those are little glimpses into the building the BEM market and how do those how are those things trending? What they mean is another question. Yeah, Mike, so to bare minimum, we have a BIPSA members over time and, and this membership over time, right? For let's say the past 10 years. Mike, you're on mute if you were answering me, but I'm pretty sure we have that. Yes, we do. <laughs> Yeah, and that has been growing. I've been also watching a couple of the LinkedIn groups that are specifically um, attract, you know, there's a, in a BIPSA one, there's also an BIPSA Energy Plus and a BIPSA eQuest. So there are all sorts of groups that have specific software tools in mind. So that might be a source of getting more information. And I'm, I'm sure other vendors have, have their own. Probably also the users on on the hours. Yeah. Note that over time. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it could also be interesting to look at the um, frequency of use of unmet hours, like unique page views over time, or. We also have conference attendance at the Building Energy Modeling Conferences. Just ignore the last few years. <laughs> Although there's a lot of the virtual, <laughs> virtual members. <laughs> yeah, it was trending upwards for a while there. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Carrie, Mike, anybody else on the call? No, it, uh, just, you know, having gone through this process, um, I felt like one of the things we were aiming for was trying to move ourselves as an industry from subjective observations, uh, you know, making policy, planning our programs, trying to figure out education and trends from subject, subjective, you know, oh, this is what I think, or this is what I see, um, moving that to more quantitative. Um, this has been a pretty good first step. Um, clearly not perfect, but it also shows that there's a path towards getting useful data that will in fact al allow us to make some of those decisions. Yeah. Uh, our earlier conversation about 
you know, so how do we right size education to meet demand for workforce in California? And that's a critical component if you're going to be ramping up your climate change initiatives and um, really pushing the use of energy modeling as one of the tools to, to provide solutions um, without knowing those numbers, that policy may fail simply because of a lack of skilled workforce. So those, that to me is, um, it does show the, the usefulness of gathering this information. Um, also, you know, our kickoff, we, <laughs> it also highlights the lack of usefulness unless you are committed to doing this as a multi-year project simply because what really matters is where are we headed? What's the trend? And what can we do about that? So, uh, you know, a good part of, like you said, a good part of this project was sort of figuring out how to get this data that is that is critical for this decision making. Um, what does repeating this methodology look like if you were to do it again next year or in three years? Uh, well, there's three bullets underneath that. One is um, now that we know how to get this information out of the LinkedIn profiles, uh, the institutional knowledge and methodology that was developed to do that already exists. So there's an economy of scale associated with that um, and applying uh, more specific useful filters for market segmentation um, would be you know, part of that first bullet. Um, the second is, uh, I think, um, getting a clearer view on who's using which tools for what kinds of projects. Um, it's a little surprising to me that you don't that we can't track CBEC, for example, users because we we just it's just not part of the policy. Uh, that would be super interesting to know who's using which, and then of course with any software vendor, they always want to make sure everybody's using the most up to date version. Who are they using it? Who are their customers? And particularly um, that the second bullet has more to do with what's the secondary market look like. So you've hired, you know, there's an engineering firm, but they may have outsourced this to somebody else, this piece of a project where they're doing the energy modeling. Um, we know that happens with uh, architectural firms. So market segmentation, the ability to actually start attaching numbers to uh, those opportunities. And then the third one, of course, uh, goes all the way from the Federal, you know, the, the highest part of the federal government trying to make policy and allocate funds for programs um, down to, you know, the guy who's standing at the, the planning desk at, a, at some small town uh, trying to figure out how to deal with Title 24 or some local ordinance and how does that all work together? Um, and the, you know, will, what's the impact of building energy modeling on, uh, you know, make decision making on all you know every level from that top level all the way down to the the planning desk of a city yeah. one thing and i'll work with carrie and mike on this uh in my other role on the global of ipsa um i am chair of the membership development committee and we're we have been planning a survey for a while to try to reach out to like many of the list, uh, particularly the LinkedIn one, um, because there are more than 10,000 members there of that one email list, but there are only about 4,500 members globally of, of, of IPSA. So that was one of the things that we were trying to find out was why they weren't and uh, what we could do to support them. But we could also ask questions about what software and, and other things that they do and segment that. Yeah, I would say that another thing we could do immediately is we have a really solid list of 8,000 people here in the United States that, that we talk to every month. Um, so running a survey of those users would probably be useful if it was highly targeted towards something like this. Yeah, this is number one question be, are you interested enough to pay to become an event, a member? <laughs> So, 
this is this is Brian. Uh, quick question: You may have already covered this, but was there any um, discussion or data collected regarding the frequency of a particular usage of software? Meaning that you know, is that person proficient, or are they just they downloaded it and tried it and don't use it again? I'm just trying to see if there's uh, you know any sort of no, because we're doing top down look here, yeah. so these are self reported people in these industries who've said they've used certain software okay. or talked about energy modeling. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's so did. heavily reliant on LinkedIn. It means that they were confident enough to list it on their profile. Sure. Say sure. what you will about how people advertise, but you know. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I know mine doesn't say anything about any of the software. Huh? Sure. <laughs> So we, we know we missed some of the market, but the other interesting aspect here was that we also had to make some assumptions that if you are using a tool and you did put it on your LinkedIn profile, that that's probably your tool of choice. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Certain level yeah, of proficiency. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. It might even be interesting to apply, uh, like to, to make a range here and apply the proportion of Ibibsa members who have or don't have software listed in their profile, like take a, a segment of folks who you know should be in this and run the same methodology in it and say, oh, you know, 25% of the people we expected got flagged. Therefore, the, the high end of this might be and apply that multiplier um, much higher. Yeah. Yeah, really good there's, point. there's a lot we can do for second and third rounds. Yeah, I know I don't list software in my profile. I probably say energy modeling somewhere. Is there any consideration given to um, sort of the pipeline? So university programs that lead to degrees or certificates or college programs that lead to certificates, trade schools, all that kind of stuff. I know that that wasn't analyzed here, but um, in order to assess the, the market capacity, future market capacity. I think that maybe what this part, the third bar was really dealing with, it was looking at skills, both already in the market, but also in the university sector. And I would say just anecdotally, I think a lot of people are learning on the job as opposed to being trained in school, but I think hopefully that is switching a bit now in more recent years. I don't know if you, if you think the same, but sort of talking through other practitioners, I, I, that's what I hear a lot. Yeah, no, a lot of engineering schools don't cover this sector at all. We covered it, but we had to do it by hand so that we understood the tools. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, that's painful. Yeah. <laughs> And I figured that that would be a very small segment of the population, but I mean, I learned on the job while I was in university. Yeah, this is Eric here. I don't think we have data on, you know, the number of college programs or number of students or, you know, number we of We have collected that in the past to see which universities are even teaching building energy modeling. Um, but uh, I haven't seen any data recently. Yeah, well, I know with BIPS USA, I've been sort of slowly and intermittently compiling lists of programs that you know people are aware of, but it's um, it's not comprehensive. BIPS is also doing a little bit of support on Solar Decathlon, which could be a, a source of data on students looking at performance modeling.
Well, it seems like it would be valuable to, you know, have somebody put in a little time just to collect some of the raw data from all these sources, you know, the things that people have just been mentioning, um, even without a significant amount of analysis on them. Um, I think they're valuable for the market, you know, to be able to have one place you could go and see some of these indicators for the market. Yeah, we, we have the background data that we collected here, but um, trying to pull all the other pieces together hasn't happened. No, I would, I mean, it would be another project, slightly different yeah. scope. Anything else occurs to people? Well, we've got our email addresses if you need, if something occurs to you after we've gone, but uh, please feel reach, please feel free to reach out to Carrie and myself or Mike, and we can, we can follow up on that. Yeah, this is Mark. So uh, for the Energy Commission, we don't collect um, individual user count data. Um, that we we're expecting that data to come from CalCERTs. Um, but we we don't have that access to CalCERTs data, but usually CalCERTs has tells us how many uh, which users are using which software to submit their documents. But uh, so um, yeah, I, just a uh, the note here, and I guess the, my team actually thinks that the numbers seem pretty pretty accurate from uh, what we understand in terms of the, our the user base. So, um, well, I'll, I'll get I'll, I'll work with Jeremy to get the uh, the draft if you can, and uh, make maybe get some other comments from our software team. And Bach, that would be. Just on the residential side, is that right? Both res and, and non-res. Is that data that you can share once you get it? Um, yeah, I think so when we get it. I'm not, we've been, we've been kind of uh, going around with our, uh, with our legal team about what, when we can get this data. So it's, it's, it's supposed to be able to be public when we do get it. Mm -hmm. Hey, Bach, this is Brian. Um, just anecdotal. Um, I, I would think that most of that data from the HERS providers would be relative to residential unless mm -hmm. there was a HERS verification, like mm -hmm. a, a duct leakage test for non-res. So I would say most of that data would be residential um, modeling. You know, so just okay. wanted to throw that out there. I, I know we've completed uh, uh, some research and was able to uh, pull data from CalCERTs and Shears regarding uh, some uh, uh, certification assessments that we're doing. And, you know, we've, we were pretty confident in the, the number of uses for a given time period. So that data is very helpful in uh, assessing the magnitude of, of, of individual users, not necessarily um, just all of the projects at large, but uh, you know, narrowing it down to how many unique uh, documentation authors were there using the performance approach. So, I feel like our, that that is a really good source, but you know, kind of limited to residential uh, market at this point. Okay. All right. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, I'd, I'd offer up that info, but unfortunately, we had an agreement with the um, the HERS providers not to share the 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 data in in uh, in granularity, you know. So, uh, but once our, our uh, report is finalized, it's you know public info, so we can we can share the you know the 
the totals that we came up with. Totals. When do you expect the report to drop? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, loaded question. <laughs> it is a loaded question. Uh, just it, it's bandwidth right now. We have the data, we're processing it, but we're concentrating on uh, course development for 2022 code right now. So it's uh, it's really close though. So, and just round numbers for the 2016 code cycle. So um, January 1, 2017 through the end of that code cycle, um, you're roughly looking at uh, around 2000 individual uh, documentation authors using the performance approach. Um, you know, so that's just kind of round numbers. Uh, we didn't get a breakdown between Energy Pro, CBEC Res, or I don't think there was any others. It might be uh, been right soft, um, but I, I would assume that's a pretty small number. But all in all, round numbers about 2,000 individual uh, documentation authors. I'm sorry if I missed it, Brian, but what's the title of this report in development? Well, the CEA or Certified Energy Analyst Assessment Research. Ah. Oh, okay. So it's the final of the teaser you've been giving it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ah. So we're uh, we're currently trying to analyze the, the data to determine um, whether or not there's um, savings potential based on certification. So. Brian, I, I'm, I don't know if you have this, but uh, oh, you said about 2,000 users over how many projects? About 200,000. Roughly, I'm, I, I'm rounding uh, it just to just from memory here. I'm not looking at uh, my, my raw data, so. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. That, that's yeah. actually, at least there's something to divide it by and figure sure. out what yeah. workloads look like and how many they're submitting. Yeah, we, we had some pretty strict criteria when we um, did our data requests through the HERS providers. And <clears throat> we wanted something that we had a, a higher likelihood of a project that was real. Um, so we said, you know, hey, give us <clears throat> um, the amount of projects and the uh, unique I, uh, documentation authors for new construction projects with at least one certificate of installation. That means that it wasn't orphaned. It wasn't like left uh, undone and somebody else opened another project on it. So we, we feel pretty confident that <clears throat> that data is solid. So we just don't know out of those documentation authors, how many overlap um, between the two HERS providers. So, mm -hmm. but one of them had predominantly uh, had the, the, the lion's share of, of, folks and the other one had a pretty small percentage so we, we feel like the number is is reasonably accurate <clears throat> to uh, characterize at least that market sector Well, again, um, any questions, reach out. Um, I've got to run to another meeting myself, but uh, thank you everyone. And thanks for the great input. Thanks guys. Thanks so much guys. Thanks all. Bye all. Bye.